Uh, so once again, a very good evening and a very grand welcome to this exciting event uh, titled Navigating Disasters, Harnessing Innovation for Effective Risk Reduction and Early Warning. Uh, I think uh, we are joined by all of speakers and uh, other panelists. So uh, disasters, whether natural or man-made, have uh, power to disrupt our lives and cause immense damage to communities, economies, and environment. And in recent years, the frequency and intensity uh, of disasters have increased, putting uh, more and more people and communities at risk. Uh, the latest episodes of earthquakes that hit Turkey, Syria, and its neighboring regions are itself an example of it. Uh, and it's uh, saddening that you know the death tolls are. Uh, it's almost it's reaching close to sixteen thousand uh, as of the latest updates. And the seventy-two, like as the seventy-two hour rescue window is being, you know, closed. Uh, I think uh, before uh, starting a session, it's only right that if we all can observe a minute of silence uh, for the victims of the disaster, and at the same time uh, keep, you know, all the uh, the staffs, the disaster management team, and the other community in our press. So I think we can uh, have a one minute of silence in remembrance of all the victims. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining in that. So events like uh, these sessions, uh, you know, highlight the importance of having an effective disaster risk reduction and early warning system in place, and especially uh, the role of innovations, uh, which you know, in in this field. So today, actually, we Spear India and uh, Khan AP, we are privileged to bring together a diverse group of experts to discuss and explore how innovation can play a critical role in reducing the risk and impacts of disaster. Uh, here, we will dwell, delve into the latest technologies, techniques, and best practices of disaster risk reduction and early warning, and explore how we can harness innovation to build more resilient and safer communities. So uh, I would like to uh, introduce our speakers uh, briefly here. Uh, so in, firstly, we have Dr. Dipanvita Dutta, Assistant Professor, Department of uh, Remote Sensing and GIS, Vidya Sagar University. Her broad area of research includes uh, drought dynamics, dry land issues, crop, crop monitoring, land use dynamics, urban space, uh, urban green space and her research projects have been funded by UGC, DST, SERP, Government of India. Dr. Datta has published more than 40 research articles and books chapter, book chapters in reputed international journals and edited book volumes. Moving on, next up we have Colonel Sanjay Srivastava, uh, Chairman, Climate Resilient Observing System Promotion Council. He has over three decades of experience of working in extreme climate change and disaster risk management as a practitioner in advisory, research, and teaching role. He's a chairman of Climate Resilient Observing System Promotion Council and also convener, convener of Lightning Res Resilient India campaign and working with Indian Meteorological Department, Ministry of Earth Science, and ISRO. Moving on, we have uh, our... Uh, before that, we had uh, one of our speaker who was Mr. Biplav Ketan Paul, Director, uh, so Narita Services and SGIF, and board member, Gujarat Ecology Commission. But unfortunately, due to some circumstances, he could not join. He had expressed his regret in uh, not being able to be in part of this session. Uh, finally, we have our moderator, Mr. Swarnapa, uh, who is the director of Prayati Group. Uh, he is an alumnus of UNESCO IHG, the Water Institute, Delft, the Netherlands, and Water 
and uh, sorry, World Bank graduate scholar, has over 20 years of experience in strategic environmental assessment, climate risk vulnerability assessment, and disaster risk reduction studies. He has worked as a specialist for IFC, World Bank, Asian Development Bank, and as well as for Petroleum Development, uh, Oman. Uh, so, uh, with this list of uh, you know wonderful speakers that we have in front of us, I am sure that we'll be able to uh, you know leverage them and to get a lot of like you know really uh, nuanced ideas on uh, you know harnessing the innovations for effective uh, risk reduction. So with that, I would like to hand it over to our moderator, Mr. Swarnabha, to you know take on with the session. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, Hana. Thanks a lot for introducing everyone and taking on from where you left. Uh, so in the context of what happened in Turkey just a few days back, and actually one of my very close friends, his family is already impacted. Uh, his brother's family is not yet found and his ancestral home is already destroyed. So I can relate to what is happening and uh, going back uh, in our own countries, what uh, is happening in Joshimot and all. I think it is very pertinent today to raise the question that how we can avoid or minimize this kind of disasters. So early warning system is a great tool to bring that change. So I would request uh, Colonel Srivastav if he can dwell on the subject of uh, introducing early warning system in the disaster risk reduction. So Colonel Srivastav, please. Uh, are you there? <clears throat> I think uh, Colonel Sivasam is um, issue. Yeah. Shana, before uh, Colonel Sivasam starts, uh, I would for say, someone uh, as the moderator, yeah. Uh, as the moderator, no, Colonel Sivastav is here, uh, so he, yeah. he can join. So uh, I would like to say that you can uh, inform the participants that in more section, there is captions and uh, in that captions, they can just um, uh, view full transcript or means uh, it, it's a multilingual thing. Many people are there, those who are not very conversant with English, so they can uh, see the transcript in their own language and they can uh, do the print screen if they're or whatever it is. So, thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. So, Colonel Sivastav, please. Uh, at the very outset, I would like to express my thanks and gratitude to Sphere India to organize a very, very pertinent event, the early warning and effective disaster risk reduction. There is a saying, early warning saves life. And we have to live with the nature. As we know, any event, any natural event happening, there is always a indicator precursor. And before I move, I would just like to play a video, which is there on the screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir, it's visible. Yes. Yeah. This is the day before the earthquake in Turkey. You can see these words. You can see they are creating, they're trying to warn us. In the tree, you can see a bunch of them there. The dogs were barking. There was a lightning for most of the night. A 
but no one noticed. Oh. So if you analyze the picture, there were birds who were chirping all around, trying to forewarn the human beings. There were dogs in the street. And I would like to inform you that lightning, the earthquake is a phenomena when there is a displacement between the two plates. You know, this earthquake was mainly due to the displacement of East Arconian plates. And when the plates are displaced, there's huge release of energy. And the entire atmospheric global electron circuit, which is there, in our atmosphere that gets disturbed. So there are disturbance in our atmospheric activities, ozone layer, electron circuit, and lightning. So these are the pre-indicators of earthquake. This was an early warning, but people were so engrossed, nobody bothered about these early warnings. And I must tell you, that today in Japan, there is a parametric based earthquake early warning system. Whenever such behavior is observed, they take cognizance and a preparedness level is increased. If you have read about the 2009 earthquake of China, it was well forecasted even by a fortnight. In India, we do not have an earthquake early warning system. If you see the earthquake of 29 July 2020 in Mexico, there were warnings issued and people came out of the house and there was just two casualties. So there are enough instances where early warning can reduce the damages, can prevent loss of life to people. Today, through this platform, I would like to address that early warning definitely saves life. It makes you prepared. Today, in India, we have India Meteorological Department, which is a mandated agency for forecast. And you must be seeing daily weather forecast which comes on, whether it is heavy rain, flood, thunderstorm, lightning, cold wave, fog. The need is that we should understand what actually disaster management is. It is not for us to understand. We have large number of programs, national cyclone risk mitigation program, heat wave program, lightning program. But what is important that these programs, what we make, these programs are for common people. And an effective disaster risk reduction is possible only and only when common people who are affected, they take, they are sensitized, they are educated, they are made to practice, and they learn how these programs are meant for, what this early warning is meant for. So my initial video, which I showed you, you imagine, if people in Turkey had taken a cognizance of this. You know, Turkey had suffered an earthquake in 1999. And Istanbul went through a comprehensive World Bank program. The damage in 99 earthquake was again 20,000 dead and a damage of almost $140 billion. 
but they came up with a program. And in 2011, when again they had an earthquake in the same region, the damage was minimal and only 11 deaths. So there are enough examples that if you take comprehensive action and go to the community, if you sensitize the community, you reduce the losses. The super cyclone in Odisha is an example. I was in army and I was the operation Sahaita commander in Ganjam district during the super cyclone. You know, we went alerting people. Those days, there was no communication of this sort. And we suffered huge loss of life. But today you see the cyclone risk mitigation program in India has paid its dividend and our deaths are minimal. Even it's less than double digit. So the early warning plays a very, very important role in effective disaster risk reduction. But it plays a role only once you sensitize the community. The program, the knowledge, the early warning has to get out of from our domain to the common people domain. And that will be the effective disaster risk reduction. Yesterday midnight, I got a call from IRC, International Response Center at Syria, which was working there. And they wanted guidelines, you know, because they are facing a problem. There is no accommodation for them. It's a war affected area. People are in various, you know, militant controlled groups. Turkey still you are getting the news, but the Rus the Syria Syrian part is a more affected. They had no early warning. And even now, when the aftershocks were coming, when entire Turkey was out, Syrians didn't know because they were at the gun points. So there are multiple hazards which cascades into a problem, into a life you know, taking problem in case of such disasters. So it is very, very important that you should have early warning system. What all early warning system comprises? Rather, what is early warning? If I ask people here, by say very simple, you know, English, early warning is basically advance information of possible hazard, which is supposed to strike. Today in a scenario which is there at Gaziantep or in Turkey or in Syria, it is not only earthquake. After the earthquake, 7th and 8th February, there were rains. The temperatures in the night went below zero degree. So a hazard is multiplied if you have lack of information. And today onwards, India has started giving them the early warning on weather. And as of now, today, there is a bright day today and the sun was there and temperature is going to improve. So there are small inputs about early warning. There's, but these inputs helps you so much in protecting life. And today in world, we have n number of scientific tools through which the early warning is available. In fact, there is an international app called Disaster Alert. You can download on your mobile phone, you can download on your computer, and you can get comprehensive early warning about any hazard which is there. In India, you know, we are a diverse country. And due to this diversity, the early warning also is required to be diverse. Say our coastal area, which is going to through a coastal hazard, say storm surge or the Deep depression, which was there last week in southern India, especially the Kerala coast and the Tamil Nadu coast. So coastal areas need a different sort of early warning system. The central India or the northern India, which was suffering about fortnight back due to fog, we need a different early warning system. And this early warning system, most effective, always is a community-based system. We need to have systems. How can we drive into the community? You saw that there were cascading road accidents where hundreds and 
you know, 50 is the number of people died. There's a road accident on the expressways. The requirement, the early warning was available that from Delhi to Agra, the visibility is 150 meter, 200 meter. The early warning was complied by the metro, but it was not complied by the expressway. The policeman or the PCR van there should have informed everybody who was going that the visibility is low and speed should have been restricted. So this early warning is just an indicator. And after early warning, there is supposed to be a set of action which is to be taken. Say if an earthquake is there, and if you get the early warning, you are supposed to get out of your house and come to the open area. Similarly, if you get an early warning of a cyclone, you are not supposed to go to the coastal you know, areas. People go on a, you know, just holiday spirit to the tourist spots that, where are you going? I'm just going to see the waves, you know, and people lose life. When there is an early warning for lightning strike, you should be under a closed cover. You should be get into inside a pakka house or a car or a bus. So, uh, Shivastav, I think uh, we have time constant also. So it's yeah. very nice listening to you. Uh, but I think uh, we also should let other uh, speakers also add sure. that is a QA session. But so, it was very nice uh, with so many examples and all. It is really elucidating. But uh, going, uh, taking like from where you left, yeah. that early warning system is requirement. But what is preventing it to be implemented in Indian context? Like today, when we look into it, we see that the early warning system for the cyclones and all are pretty mature. Whereas for the flood or the earthquake or uh, like glacial break, those are still not there. So what is the um, um, problem there? Uh, so may I ask uh, Dr. Dipanita, Dr. to just focus on that and. Ma'am, you are mute. Ma'am, you are muted. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, yes, now. Okay. Uh, could you please repeat the question? Uh, what I'm saying that, uh, well, uh, Colonel Sivastav explained it very nicely and put it uh, uh, firmly that early warning system is a requirement today. But uh, when we look into the scenario, like for the cyclones and this kind of the storm surge, the system is still working. We see that in the coastal areas, uh, people are moving out. The casualties have gone down a lot. Uh, but still, when we look into the flood or this earthquake or say glacial break, this kind of scenarios, the early warning system is still not working. So what's preventing the things to work in this kind of scenarios? So what is the blockage here? Okay. If you can. Uh, I think the availability of data, availability of data and proper models. Uh, that is uh, one, one of the many challenges. Uh, that's why uh, the such kind of early warning systems couldn't be built up. And uh, we need real-time data, accurate data, which can be used for uh, uh, robust for uh, for using as input in several robust models. And also, I think uh, the use of uh, uh, very uh, uh, robust models like uh, machine learning, deep learning, this is very new in this field. So uh, these models can be explored to improve the accuracies, accuracies, and also we can improve the early warning system. So uh, if now if we talk about the machine learning or the deep learning, how to take it to the common people, to the community level? Because for them, they need something on their uh, available communication system that, well, this is going to happen or this is coming in uh, this much time, so move or do this. So how to translate these things to that? Okay. Uh, actually, this these things are not part of common people. Common people can only get the information that when and uh, when this uh, disaster is happening. Common people need that much information and um, uh, before starting that disaster, 
so that they can uh, they can they can leave their house they can uh, stop their uh, existing work like uh, the fishermen if they are um, warned uh, before certain time then they cannot go to the deep sea for fishing so uh, these things this is related to proper communication system if we can improve the communication system and uh, if the or if all the medias are working together then uh, we can warn our um, common people before any kind of hazard so uh, are you in a way referring that this uh, deep learning or the ai based models the output of that should be made available to the community level people so there need to be some kind of interfacing here no 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 it is not possible because this kind of models need proper expertise and only uh, only one ex expert uh, in this field can uh, prepare a warning system proper warning system we can use the information from the experts of this deep learning or machine learning uh, based models uh, we can use the information or outcome of these models to uh warn the common people but common people cannot use these things they only require the information and uh, they can't use this models these models require lots of expertise and also input of several uh, data several data like uh, satellite based um, remote sensing data sets are needed as input while we are uh, doing any kind of prediction model for um, floods or uh, droughts so uh, this this is not the work of common Ma people i am we not saying experts. that the community people should run the models i am talking about the translation of the information from the model to the community so uh, many yes, times what possible. we are saying that the models have run they have got the data but that is not getting shared to the community so there is a total lack of interfacing here yes that's why i have mentioned that uh, all the Uh, 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 all all parts of our society and uh, the media should work together so that the outcome of our research uh, from the research lab to the home of our local people that can uh, that that information can reach to each and every one's home uh, and also our media the... electronic oh, media yeah uh, karan swatav i think you also want to join in here absolutely you see the early warning the system in india what we have that it is called early warning and dissemination system and in our country india meteorological department say is a early warning initiator they generate early warning but the dissemination to the public is the job of the state disaster management authority district disaster management authority and today nine states in india which includes odisha the moment early warning is generated there is a api which is generated that api goes from the imd server to the osdma server and we have preset messages you know in odia languages based on the type of threats and that sort of messages and there are various systems like there are level of disaster level 1 level 2 level 3 based on this initially the information is kept with the administrator depending on the type of crisis coming the location of the crisis then there are various networks one is the network of the administrators you know what they are supposed to do say like district disaster management officer the revenue staff which is there at the block and panchayat level so there is one network of that second network is of the our emergency responder that is in case of odisha like we have odraf we have ndrf over there we have ambulance services over there so second network goes to that third is the community initially when the disaster is supposed is about to strike only administrator and the responders are being informed third level when community is likely to be affected then community method messages are given so for that we have a satark app which is in odia for all languages and even for road accidents it is sent to them so early warning and dissemination service 
the biggest problem why it is not reaching is the communication what you know deepan vita ma'am was saying uh, we do not have established communication with the vulnerable community say a farmer who is working in the agriculture field and suddenly there is going to be lightning strike how to reach that farmer that is a problem say a fisherman is gone out in the sea the trawlers they go out for 2 to 3 days and suddenly there is a deep depression which forms how to communicate with them you know because they also at times violate the rules they go longer distance in sea so reaching the vulnerable people the communication with the people who are endangered that is the biggest problem what we have today and that is why i say the there has to be a culture of safety and prevention by among everybody but as also i think you just gave me the prelude to ask the next question so yeah. then what kind of innovation we can think of to basically mitigate this particular problem of communicating with the people from the interfacing agencies absolutely you know when flood comes in mahanadi belt or in bihar one village to other village how do they how do they communicate they have a dhol system and they beat the dhol or nagada and the next village comes to know okay water level has risen there are numbers you know if four nagada four beats are there there is rise of 4 meter so they have that sort of communication system similarly innovations in disaster management especially cyclone tsunami you know the behavior of the sea before any tsunami or cyclone there is absolute calm and the sea water is receded deep inside because my personal experience i i am a air defense officer so gopalpur on sea and chandipur on sea has been my karm bhumi you know and whenever such bad you know high surge is supposed to come in the sea the sea retracts you know goes down and there sudden you know so there are such innovative things which are available we have to read in between the lines we have to go on to our traditional means and then use the communication technology to reach up to the maximum people so that we can save life so there has to be innovation local innovation is very important you see our lord jagannath temple have you ever heard lightning striking lord jagannath temple never it has happened rameshwaram temple it is not bijli mahadev in himachal it strikes but nobody dies we have traditional systems so we need to identify those innovations which are there in our society and in our house construction system we have a system of laying down the foundation stone with dhatu and then we have a pole metal pole and that goes up in the air so that is what that is a lightning conductor but when the britisher came we forgot our own you know traditional knowledge and we started putting that foreign made franklin rod not the indian nishan so we need to have our own traditions identified technology identified related and innovation has to be done you know that is how you do it we have we have that kabutar we used to have we used to send the messages so that sort of innovation local innovation is required so with that we may conclude that uh, well you know uh, early warning system is a necessity today and uh, we cannot depend only on the ultra scientific or uh, only technology based uh, communication system to commit to the uh, local community level but we also need to use our traditional means of communication because many times what we are seeing that those uh, very advanced communication systems are the ones that are directly getting affected so my mobile tower is not there uh, during the flood so i need to communicate in some other way so with that i would like to have the floor open for the question answer session so please whoever has any question please raise their hand and we'll continue i think uh, dr b s tiwari wants to have a question dr tiwari please go ahead I think Dr. Tiwari 
Yes. Yeah, Dr. Theodi, you, you had raised your hand. You want to say something? Uh, I think Dr. Theodi's uh, audio system has some issue. So if somebody else wants to come in, uh, um, there is Dr. a question Chidurus from Naudi. There in. is a question from Naudi that there were sirens in Delhi, and those sirens have stopped after 2011. You know, these are civil defense sirens, and in our childhood, we have seen the 71 war when siren used to be played, and we used to go down into the trenches. These sirens are very important, especially in the border areas and all areas. In case of any disaster, oblique war, these sirens are used. The Department of Home, Fire and Civil Defense, it is their prime duty that this siren should be functional. They are the public notification system. Even if early warning is there, the dissemination in India, there is a system. We have a Civil Defense Act 1968, but somehow in the exuberance, the disaster management is forgetting this civil defense system. So the siren must be made operational. There are funds allotted. There are rehearsals always done. But most of the places it is happening in paper. And Delhi is one of the place. So civil defense people, please make sure that your siren is affected. In a civil defense system, a mohalla is divided into yeah. sector, sector into division and division into command. So there is a proper structure of civil defense. Somehow, over a period of time, with NDRF, other comings, I find the civil defense, the basic structure with the community disaster management is losing its importance. So yeah, it I think Dr. Tiwadi wants to come in. Yeah. Dr. Tiwadi, please. Yeah, I'm um, sorry, the, uh, the, uh, it was not getting unmuted. Now it is. <clears throat> Thank you for organizing this uh, uh, webinar. And I am I fully support uh, Colonel Srivastava uh, that, uh, in fact, I was uh, part of the NDRF Raging Day a few days back at Vigyan Bhavan. And now the the challenge lies uh, i'll i'll take one uh, aspect that is the artificial intelligence uh, the it's uh, we have to the government of india has got a, a huge program and otherwise also one can take uh, the ai and ml uh, that has been started at uh, school level uh, also at uh, college level so uh, uh, what is required, what you had asked uh, was a very pertinent thing was that uh, uh, how, to, how to get this, the uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in a mode that, that could be used by uh, the common, common man. Uh, the, this, has, this has been practiced uh, all over and, and now like uh, kind of this, this is available. What, what uh, uh, and what Colonel Srivastava is saying, that's also, uh, I endorse him that the challenge challenge is uh, to work to the grassroots people, the person who is unaware and who also may not be having uh, a mobile itself. Even if you have mobile, uh, we from the IIT, we had, we had some program, I was part of the program uh, with the uh, agriculture ministry also. Uh, so uh, we did with IFCO Sanchar, with the, the uh, Airtel uh, uh, and few other companies. So uh, it was for the soil analysis, some something uh, like that, soil analysis, uh, uh, which was, uh, and also for uh, the plant disease. Only those those messages, which were, which were a result of the artificial intelligence modeling, the, the uh, uh, mathematical modeling and AI modeling, uh, they, that thing that was uh, uh, that was passed on a, on a secure number to their packs, like uh, cooperative societies, uh, uh, the agriculture societies. So I came across a few voluntary organizations uh, uh, and uh, the civil societies. They are only working for early warning um, of the flood and uh, other places there. They are located uh, the, uh, at the village only, and and they they have they are 
uh, well uh, structured so uh, the it is it is important for the civil administration now most of the times you find that uh, even in uh, when you say in civil administration disaster management is one additional charge that is given to some person who will be looking after the public administration uh, agriculture gd protocol and will be one additional charge so uh, we from here being sphere india or uh, the other organizations we need to somehow be uh, and uh, of course the npdrr is coming national platform for disaster risk reduction uh, we had uh, resummit india 2047 in vigyan bone of which i was fortunately a part so we have to project this where to have this we keep talking of last mile engagement last mile engagement but these people have to be invited to such functions and the functions have to be held uh, all across uh, it it has to be held at mahanadi it has to be held at gorakhpur it has to be held at ganjam it has to be held at trivandrum rather than in vigyan bhavan uh, or in in taj so uh, uh, thank you uh, for that and also one more thing quickly i would like to add we have been talking of the problems uh, intervention uh, like kanal uh, srivastava uh, we have been um, i too have been interfering uh, at the part of the armed forces officer there and also as part of uh, research with uh, iit and also part of the civil aviation uh, we participated in that nepal earthquake gulf so i'll tell you one incident where at 3 o'clock sorry to interrupt you sir yeah. uh, like in the interest yes, of time if you could wind yeah, it up are, in the seconds can. So we, we can we can, we can we can provide an art, uh, we can provide portable water uh, uh, which is which, which we also saw in kerala flood that uh, disasters are there but we can also provide uh, at that time a clean water which is iron free arsenic free and fluoride free otherwise we are creating more disasters thanks a lot thank you very much thank you dr tiwari for your inputs uh, i think uh, dr zaidul islam is also there as well so dr zaidul islam can you please come in yes we can hear you thank you very much for uh, uh, arranging such a, a very nice uh, 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 meeting um, and uh, thanks uh, to dr sanjay Colonel Sanjay, uh, this is a very nice presentation. Basically, I have one or two observations. Uh, I am from Bangladesh. Uh, I am uh, with uh, Karn AP, Climate Action Research Network. Um, my point is, uh, in Bangladesh, we have uh, we have seen, uh, we have been uh, seeing, experiencing many disasters. Uh, but uh, uh, my experience suggests that uh, our institutional framework uh, and the organogram of the institutions like MODMR and other organizations who are dealing with these particular challenges are not uh, ready enough to just deal with the science data early warning and how, how to how to deal with that and just only one or two organizations are uh, uh, in the focus to just uh, uh, you know address those particular challenges so uh, do you think that this is a kind of proposition that, that do you think that Uh, we need to um, uh, uh, develop or uh, redefine the institutional structures uh, uh, relating to the policies that we have uh, in our hand at this moment. Uh, those uh, institutional frameworks, the mandates, and the organograms are developed uh, mainly by the British uh, for their particular purposes. Uh, is it uh, enough uh, to just deal with the challenges that we have been facing, or we need to just think and refine, define that particular thing? Uh, thank you so much. This is this is just just an observation. Thank you so much. In fact, I would like to reply you that the in India when it got independence, we had only one system of relief. You know, yeah. India and Bangladesh both. But it was two thousand five when we had the National Disaster Management Authority and Act and complete institutional framework came up. today indian institutional framework that is a national disaster management authority state district and even in gram panchayat level the disaster management gpdp is there where disaster management is integrated so that framework there is a institutional framework there is a scientific framework which gives a scientific support right from national level to the grassroots level and there is a responders framework that is a from national disaster management authority to state disaster management 
sorry, National Disaster Response Force to SDRF. And we have a network of NGOs, the current platform of sphere which we are at is a group of basically non-government organizations. So in a vast country like this, we have an institutional framework and it is working well, but disaster is innovative and God is beyond human. We have to understand this. So we have to be proactive. We have to be always prepared, ready and no, undertake disasters. We cannot take it you know, lightly. No disaster can be taken lightly. So the survival is for the fittest. Whosoever is prepared, he is watchful, his eyes and ears are open, and he is ready to respond, he survives. So this is a basic fundamental, and we have a very good in institutional infrastructure. And even other countries like uh, African countries, even European countries and US, they are taking us. We have also taken good things from other countries. Like we have a now single emergency number in India. That is 112. In case of any hazard, any problem, medical, health, disaster, just press 112. It is an app. You just press it and the response will reach you within 10 minutes. So that sort of institutional framework has come up in India. We have 108 ambulance services which are there. In case of medical need, the ambulance reaches your house. That is a hospital reaching your house with medical personnel. So with growing technology, growing need, this is an evolving process. But yes, the institutional system is Isn't the important system. Yeah. Okay. So um, thank you, Karnas Vastav, for so much input. And at the end, I would like to uh, summarize all this as that we have progressed. We have got early warning system, but uh, more miles to go and uh, maybe we should think of having a incubation center or uh, like there are incubation center for medical devices the incubation center for uh, communication and those maybe we should also think of incubation center for dedicated for early warning systems developing in-house early warning systems uh, and um, that should be propagated along the bureaucracy uh, because in many places we are seeing that we have everything but still implementation is lacking so maybe we need to sensitize the people who are implementing it much more. So instead of giving an additional uh, uh, responsibility, we should dedicate people who will be dealing with it. So with that, I would request... Again, again, uh, again your incubation center answer. Mm -hmm. In Odisha, Jharkhand, Northeast, we have created incubation centers mm -hmm. in universities for early warning. Okay. And yeah. students so are that going should be done across India, not so only in few places. Across India and everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, I would request uh, Dr. Anirudh Day to give the vote of thanks. Thanks, Sarnabo, uh, for moderating the whole session very nicely. Uh, thanks to Colonel Sivastava, uh, Madam Dipanita Dotto, um, and uh, the organizers. Actually, uh, behind the scene, there were Silvio, uh, there were uh, um, other members from Sphere India. Uh, so I would like to thank on behalf of Climate Action Resource Network, Khan AP, uh, it's Asia Pacific. So uh, I would like to thank all of you for your hard work. And uh, this, uh, for the next session, we really would like to Remember that it's a um, Asia Pacific um, uh, presence of the members are beyond India. So we have to, because now what Colonel Sivastava has said, uh, there are, uh, uh, I, I mean, um, uh, metals to take for other countries, some examples other countries can take. Uh, Madam Dipanita Dutto, she also said the same thing. Uh, I would uh, lastly, uh, my role is to just convey a vote of thanks. So I would like to thank all of you for participating, for uh, uh, sharing your views, for uh, uh, the hard work behind the scene also. Uh, and at the same time, uh, on the content part, I'd like to say I, I really appreciate Colonel Sivastavu what he has said and uh, Madam Dutta uh, what uh, she has said. 
that it is people should be uh, taken in the center and it is people centric and dissemination. Dissemin we maybe we have maybe in other countries also they have something data maybe available in this form, this way or that way. They can the governments can organize, can arrange anything, but the common people, common people should uh, uh, be aware and uh, common people, this, this dissemination, what we have discussed a lot on this. So we can think of small community radio things. So how these messages can be disseminated. So these are some options available where uh, I do appreciate when Colonel Sivastavo had uh, referred the colonial regime and why we have started forgetting. Since when we have actually started forgetting uh, our own traditional knowledge systems and uh, we are not practicing those things. So that is very important to keep in mind and uh, this community radio, we are, we are uh, not keeping batteries, not keeping cells, not the radio uh, as we are listening to. So we have, we have lost that habit also. So somehow uh, there are ways. So I would like to thank again to all of you. Uh, uh, and um, um, I wish that uh, every Thursday we have this program and uh, every Thursday, next Thursday is uh, on 16th. So there will be another program then on the next Thursday. So uh, it will continue till 31st of March. And this is Sphere India Academy. They organized it and Sphere India Academy on behalf of Sphere India Academy. I would also like to say that uh, I'm one of the executive committee members of Sphere India. And uh, this academy, it's, a, it's an innovative approach to disseminate knowledge among the common people, common practitioners, those who are coming from the villages. And this is uh, possible because the common uh, people can get it translated. So in their own languages. So that is that option is there. So I would like to uh, thank the communities, those who have participated. Uh, I am not uh, going to take names. So those who have participated, and the speakers and the organizers and the moderator from Climate Action Resource Network Asia Pacific, as well as the facilitating agency, the Secretariat of Climate Action Resource Network Asia Pacific. So thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so I believe that we have uh, had a very interactive uh, session today and it was very informative. Uh, once again, on behalf of Sphere and Kanepi, I would like to thank everyone. Um, so we would be sharing the recording and the re report with all of you. And I hope we can come up with more informative sessions like this again. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah.